Last week I put out a video on the Epic Hi-Fi build and a lot of you guys really enjoyed it, but you wanted to know a little bit more of the technical details, the what's and the why's. What did I do? Why did I do it? And so this video is going to go into a little bit more of the technical details of the Epic Hi-Fi build. So whenever you're building a speaker, you got to design some goals. And I did. I wanted to build a speaker that I felt like for the same price you wouldn't be able to get on the open market. And I was going to be able to do this by achieving a couple goals. Now, the first goal was linearity. I wanted to make sure that this particular speaker would play very well at very low volumes and also play just as good at high volumes. I also wanted to make sure that it was small and compact, something that you could easily put out. You don't need necessarily a whole new room for these speakers. I wanted something that could go very low in bass, so somewhere in the 30 hertz range and equally and still extend all the way up to 20 kilohertz. I also wanted a two-way speaker with low distortion. Now, this is not an easy task. And honestly, up until recently, it was probably going to be pretty much an impossible task. So how did we go ahead and come out with this Epic Hi-Fi build and how did we choose the particular drivers? Well, the first thing I had to do was find a driver that was capable of being crossed over high enough to be used with a tweeter while also being able to get that low end extension down to 30 hertz and maintain its linearity. And I was able to find that with the Dayton Epic five and a half inch driver. Now here's the deal with this Dayton Epic five and a half inch driver. It is very unique. There's not many drivers on the market like it. It is really in a class of its own, but you don't have to take my word for it. Why don't you take the man who literally wrote the book on speaker building, Vance Dickinson's word. This is what Vance Dickinson said about the Epic driver. Looking at all the data shows this driver to be in a category all on its own. It produces very good low frequency performance for a five inch driver and indeed is capable of being utilized in a two and three way design. Giving the overall design and build quality, this is a well-crafted product specifically intended for the compact two-channel home theater or studio monitor market. And that was great to hear because that's exactly what these speakers were hopefully designed for, either two-channel listening or for front-channel home theater. And I gotta say, they knocked it out of the park. Now, when we talk about linearity of a driver, what we're talking about is the driver producing the same results at uh, low power as it does high power. And that's actually harder to come across than you would think. Now the Dayton Epic and CSS driver both do this with a split gap motor system. Now these same split gap motor systems actually that are utilized lower distortion as well and give you uh, higher power handling, which is perfect for what we're trying to accomplish. So, the Dayton does this by using their multiple magnet system. It has one magnet on the bottom with multiple magnets on the top. And the basic premise behind this is that as the voice coil travels through there, it stays within that magnetic field longer, which allows it to continue that linearity and give it a extreme amount of excursion. And in this particular case, it really does. The excursion on this five and a half inch driver is 14 millimeters. Now, just to put that into perspective, that's more than a lot of 12 inch subwoofers. And it's five millimeters more than the W5 by Tang Band that's used in the Dynas that so many people go crazy over. So this is a significant increase in excursion and I love it. Now the CSS also uses their XBL split gap motor system. Once again, that helps maintain that linearity. So that allows us to be able to use these speakers up close near field or even far away for like a home theater system. And that was something that was really important to me. Now, just because I knew the Epic driver could work and was going to be linear, doesn't mean that it was necessarily going to be compact in size and also going to be able to get the tuning frequency. So whenever you choose a driver like this, you need to throw it into something like WinISD and see what the tuning frequency is going to be. And when I started testing this out with different ports, I know the ports were gonna have to be uh, very long and we we're gonna have issues with port resonance. Um, and we might even have issues with uh, airflow coming out for port noise, are you actually hearing that? And I just decided it really wasn't worth doing a port for because by the end of the day, it's no longer gonna be a compact speaker because the port's gonna be so long and we're gonna have other issues that we have to deal with. So instead of going ported, I chose to go with a passive radiator. Now, keep in mind, I, I want sound quality to be really important on this particular build. So 
by choosing the passive radiators, we could bypass those other issues that we were having with while maintaining a compact size. And now with this particular build with two of these five and a half inch drivers, I was able to use two eight inch passive radiators and these passive radiators uh, allow up to 125 watts of power which is good for up to 106 decibels. So more than enough power than what most people would need for these particular drivers. And I gotta say, they got incredibly loud, louder than I could personally have ever want to listen to, let's put it that way. Now, when designing the passive radiators, uh, I was able to tune it to the mid thirties. So I was able to hit my goal in the 30 Hertz range. And honestly, inside a room, you're most likely going to be able to get some type of room gain there too. So by doing that, you're probably going to be able to get 20 Hertz inside your room, making it truly a full range speaker but you are gonna have to let your room make up for some of that bottom end. The passive radiators I stuck on both sides and that's to make sure that the speaker doesn't walk on you. It allows even pressure on both sides pushing back and forth, which does make the cabinet more inert. So why did I choose two Epic drivers and why did I choose the orientation that I did? And there's, there's a couple reasons for that. The first reason why I chose two is for all the positives that the Epic drivers have, there's one thing that they kind of missed a mark on and that's sensitivity. The sensitivity of the drivers are about 83 decibels. Now, one of the things you wanna know about the Dayton Epics is that they're a dual voice coil. And when they're being tested, they're being tested at an eight ohm load. And so I know that I can increase the sensitivity by lowering the impedance load and by giving multiple of the woofers. So if I put two of the woofers in, that's going to give me a three decibel, theoretical three decibel increase in sensitivity. And by lowering the impedance by adding a second one, so lowering it from eight ohm to four ohm, that now allows me to get another theoretical three decibels, making this no longer an 83 decibel sensitive speaker, but closer to an 89, which is much more reasonable for most people. So the way that you had to wire these is a little bit different than what you'd wire a normal speaker. Since there are dual voice coils, you have to run uh, one of the voice coils in series. So basically you take the negative of one of the woofers and bring it to the positive on the other side of the same woofer. You do that for both of them. And then you run them both in parallel. So the ones that are now available, you should have a positive and a negative available on each one of the voice coils of each subwoofer. You're gonna run positive to positive and negative to negative. And now that's gonna give you a four ohm load and giving you that theoretical six decibel boost in sensitivity. And that's a huge boost for the sensitivity of this particular speaker. So now people are gonna ask, why did I choose the tweeter at the top with the two woofers on the bottom? Why didn't I put a woofer, a tweeter and a woofer? And there's benefits both ways of why you wanna do this. Some people prefer MTM, some people prefer TMMs. There's really no wrong reason here. It's just a design choice of what you wanna do. I chose a TMM for a couple of reasons. One, I think more people are used to seeing the tweeter on the top versus the MTM. Two, I think the tweeter at the top is typically easier for you to put at your level. And three, I created a speaker not too long ago called the Uglies and everyone really loved them and always wanted to see a smaller version of them. And this was kind of my chance to create a smaller mini version of the Uglies. And I gotta say that played a huge role into the orientation that I picked. But really at this point in time, that is really just a design choice that the designer has to choose. Could you create this as an MTM? Absolutely, but you would have to change the crossover. Speaking of the crossover, let's go ahead and talk about that. So the crossover, when we look at the CSS tweeter, it looks like this could be crossover, well, pretty much anywhere. So we could cross over the woofer fairly low. But when you're designing a crossover, you also need to take into other considerations such as distortion. So I did do distortion measurements on both the woofers and the CSS tweeter. And I was surprised to see the CSS tweeter started getting a rise in distortion about 1.2 kilohertz. And that to me made me think, okay, I need to cut that off sooner than 1.2 kilohertz. And really, I need to cut that off pretty hard to make sure that I don't have to worry about the distortion creeping into my final frequency response. So because of that, I cut this off right around 1.6 kilohertz. Worked for the woofer and it worked also for the tweeter. The off-axis measurements were fine at that crossover point. So I wasn't worried about beaming from that particular point in the woofers. And by doing a third order on the tweeter, I was able to really cut down that distortion so that it's no longer problematic inside the final frequency response, which makes this once again, a very clean 
speaker, which is one of the things I was really going for. Now, this is just some of the technical details that I had to go over. There were obviously other technical things that I needed to think about, such as even the size of the cabinet that I didn't really go over in this video, but I do talk a lot of those things with my patrons. In fact, we actually did a live video on the crossover and explaining where to cross it over, taking measurements and things of that nature. And it was a really great time. So if those types of things interest you, then feel free to check out my patron. You'll get some behind the scenes looks and hopefully maybe learn a little bit more about these things. But otherwise, I hope that this video helped you at least understand some of the intricacies and some of the technical things that you need to think about when designing and building a speaker. This is Toys DIY Audio, and I'm out.